Hi, today I want to talk about EDS, or Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy. EDS is a way of getting information about the composition of a sample when looking at it under an electron microscope, rather than just getting an image of that sample. So as with my past videos, I'll do a little bit of theory first, and if you're not bored by the point that uh, I finished that, then you can stick around for an actual demo of this spectrometer here working on my microscope. Energy Dispersive X-ray Spectroscopy, sometimes abbreviated EDS or EDX, is an analysis technique that uses the generation of characteristic X-rays to identify um, certain materials or compounds in a sample. So I'm going to explain what all of that means and talk about some of the advantages and shortcomings of this method. You'll commonly find these EDS or EDS EDX systems on electron microscopes, either scanning or transmission. And this is most convenient because we're utilizing the electron beam and optics that are already in the microscope to partially excite the sample and use the energies that that gives off um, to identify the, the sample itself. So there's another technique called WDS, Wavelength Dispersive Spectroscopy, and these are larger uh, spectrometers and they are uh, a little bit better actually. Um, than the EDS system, but they're less convenient and more expensive, and they're, they're just, it's a whole other field to look at. So some of the basic parameters of EDS are given here, and in parentheses I have WDS, just so you can compare it. So the system that I have and most of these EDS systems are good uh, between boron and uranium. So they can identify a pretty wide amount of elements, but simply between below boron, so hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, the uh, X-ray energies given off by them are just too small to um, be quantified. They're below the noise of the detector. So um, anything heavier than boron is, is basically good. And these systems are good to um, quantify things greater than 1500 part per million concentration. So it's not good enough for everything, but um, it, it's pretty good. So it's nowhere near um, anything like SIMS or WDS. The resolution of the system I have here, because it's a silicon drift detector and not uh, an old silicon lithium detector, is 127 electron volts, and that's uh, quite good, we'll, we'll see later, and WDS can be below 10 EV as well. Now the spatial resolution is the amount of the sample that's actually excited when the electron, the incident beam, hits the sample. This is the area um, whose spectral information we're quantifying. So for low atomic number samples, that's between 1 to 5 cubic microns, and for uh, high atomic number samples, that can be considerably smaller. But you'll notice that these sizes are pretty massive in microns, they're not nanometers like for other uh, spectros spectroscopy techniques. So um, you may be identifying parts of the sample outside of the viewing range in the SEM. You could be zoomed in at 300,000 times magnification and only looking at um, a small nanoparticle or something, but you're going to get spectral information from everything around that um, to, to this, uh, this effect here. When the incident beam hits a sample, there's um, a lot of things that can happen. There's an inelastic and elastic scattering, and a great portion of the energy in the electron beam is transferred to the sample as heat. And if you run uh, an SCM for extended periods of time at high beam currents, when you take your sample out and you feel it, it can actually be warm sometimes. This is uh, how electron beam welding works. So the energy that's not transferred into the sample as heat um, can be transferred a lot of other ways. And two energies that are given off from the sample when, an, when exposed to an incident electron beam um, are different types of x-rays. So this is my drawing of an atom here and with three discrete uh, electron energy orbitals around it. Uh, there's a lot going on there, I'll explain that in a minute here. But when a high energy beam uh, is, is aimed at atom, there's a couple of different x-rays that can be given off. The first is basically a nuisance to what we're trying to do here. You want to get rid of it, and ideally it wouldn't exist, but of course it, it does. And this is continuum x-ray generation. There's a the German word for it is Bremsstrahlung. I, I don't know, I'm not going to try to say that. Um, and this, these, are, these x-rays are not characteristic of the atom they came from. There's no way of differentiating continuum x-rays from 
a uh, cobalt atom from a, a, a iron atom. So this basically makes up the noise floor, and if the characteristic x-rays are lower um, in counts than the continuum x-rays of what you're trying to analyze, then it's going to be impossible. And this, um, the, the German word, I think means something to the effect of slowing down radiation. And when the incident beam interacts with the nucleus, the coulombic force of the nucleus will actually change the trajectory of the electron beam and slow it down. It'll kind of get bent around the, the dense nucleus. And the amount of kinetic energy lost from that electron being slowed down by the nucleus is given off as a continuum x-ray. Now the kind of x-ray that's actually important to what we're doing here are the characteristic x-rays. And I'll show you in a second how you can quantify these and see what type of atom um, they came from. These are generated by inner shell vacancies filled by outer shell electrons. So let's take a look at that. So here's my beautiful drawing of an atom here. And of course we've got the nucleus, which I drew way too large in the center, and it's surrounded by three orbitals. And we'll label them K, L, and M from the inside to the outside. The K orbital has two electrons in it. The L has eight and the M, I think I drew 18. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was fully loaded. So, if you think about this atom in its ground, unexcited state, all of the electrons would like to be um, at the lowest energy state possible. They'd like to be closer to the nucleus, and that's just the, the um, lowest amount of potential energy. And if, now the M shell, because it's the furthest away, has the highest potential energy. It has the highest physical distance that it can fall into the nucleus and therefore um, it has a higher energy associated with it and the K of course has the lowest energy um, out of all of this. When an energetic electron beam hits the sample it can sometimes knock out an inner shell electron so from here we're knocking out this K shell electron and here's the original incident electron coming off at a scattered angle and then this is the ejected electron. And when that occurs, the most probable event to happen next would be an electron from the L shell to fall in and take that vacancy. It's also possible that one from the M shell will fall back to the K shell, but it's further away. So the most probable thing to occur would be the L, to f L electron to fill the vacancy in the K that was created, and that releases a K X-ray. Now there's K alpha and K beta x-rays. This would be a K alpha x-ray. A K beta x-ray would be if something from the M shell fell to the K shell. So alpha is when the adjacent shell electron fall, falls in to fill the vacancy, and beta is when an electron from two shells away, not the adjacent one. So the when you're looking at a sample, the K alpha signal will always be greater, or almost always be greater than the K beta signal, um, because it's a, it's a more probable event of happening. So the really important thing here is when that electron from the K orbital falls into fill the vacancy uh, from the L orbital rather falls in to fill the vacancy we created in the K orbital the difference in energy between these orbitals is given off in the form of an x-ray. The energy difference between these shells are different um, for all the atoms of the periodic table. And this is important because we can quantize with a detector, we can quantize the um, energy given off in the form of an x-ray when the electron fills the vacancy and we can see in electron volts the actual energy difference between these shells. So. In this case here, we have a double ionization occurring where both K and L x-rays are given off. And we'll see in a second how um, the system, an EDS system, can actually count the energy of those x-rays and uh, therefore you can start to guess at what that atom could be composed of. If you'd like a more in-depth analysis of this, there's a great book, I don't know if that's in focus or not, uh, scanning electron microscopy and micro X-ray microanalysis. So now we understand where all of these low energy X-rays are coming from. We have to detect them and quantify them so that we can actually gain information about the sample that we're analyzing. So the detector is in this drawing here a magical black box where X-rays enter and a signal comes out the other side, an electrical signal whose voltage is proportional 
to the X-ray energy. There's two big types or main types of uh, these EDS detectors. There's the older style, which are the silicon lithium detectors, and these are cooled by liquid nitrogen. So if you see an SEM setup, and there'll be a funnel or a big cryostat or a big uh, thing of liquid nitrogen nearby, and they're using one of these detectors. That's the older style. I was lucky enough to pick up an SDD or a silicon drift detector system, and these need only be cooled by a Peltier module. So um, as to get the electronics down um, so the, the, the thermal noise is low enough that you can actually get useful information out of it. So this is a much easier system to deal with and uh, a cleaner system as well. So in both of these, you're probably already guessing at how they work. It, they guess um, that they work similar to semiconductor detectors in other systems for other types of radiation or for backscatter electrons, etc. So the X-rays will generate electron hole pairs when they strike the semiconductor. They, pr they can promote electrons from the valence to conduction shells. And once those electrons are moving around and conducting, they are separated. The electrons and hole um, pairs are, are separated and um, uh, with a high voltage bias, and they are quantized. They're, they're counted. In the case of a roller detector, one electron hole pair would be generated for every 3.76 or 3.8 electron volts of x-rays. So if you think about that, the um, x-ray energies for atoms are in the 100 to 1500 electron volt range. Some are, are higher, of course. So we're looking at uh, hundreds to thousands of electrons that we're counting here. It's a very, very small amount. And this is one of the reasons why that cooling is important. So the thermal noise, the, the electrical thermal noise of the system is low enough to get actual usable information out of this. When we're counting hundreds of electrons, the instrumentation has to be extremely precise and low noise. That's also why we can do um, acquisitions over long periods of time, and uh, the more data we have, um, we, the lower uh, effective noise floor you, you can get. Now, in a silicon drift detector, I didn't attempt to draw one of these, so I know I butcher it, but I can show you on, on screen right now. And rather than just a standard semiconductor detector, they have concentric rings with an anode um, in the center, and they actually integrate the field effect transistor, which is the first part of the preamplifier. They integrate that right onto the silicon. So right off the bat, that gives you lower capacitances. You don't have to deal with bond wires um, getting the the charge off of the semiconductor detector. If you can put the FET right on the back of that, then you have better performance right off the bat. And sometimes that anode is actually offset and these concentric rings look like a teardrop. And that's so that the incident beam, when it strikes the center of the detector, um, the x-rays don't screw with the, the FET. But anyway, the purpose of these concentric rings is to create an electric field uh, in the plane of that detector so that it actually sweeps the hole pairs and makes them drift to the anode. And the anode can be much smaller when we're directing the hole pairs directly to it. And that small collection site for all of this, uh, for all of these hole pairs, electron hole pairs, that smaller collection site allows you to have a uh, much smaller device capacitance overall. And this is in the, the range of maybe 50 to 100 femtofarads. And that leads you to better performance, lower noise, faster detection, you don't need the liquid nitrogen cooling and better resolution. So overall, it's just a, a nicer detector. So the, the electronics outside of the semiconductor detector are basically the same for the older sil silicon lithium or silicon drift detectors. Um, they look something like this from a higher level. The x-rays hit the detector, and the detector gives off pulses for each individual uh, x-ray event. So we're actually counting individual pulses here. It's pretty incredible. And in the case of the SDDs, like I said, the FET is integrated right onto the, the same uh, wafer. They're monolithic. And there's a preamplifier and a feedback capacitor. Now for every x-ray event where the whole pairs are generated, swept off to the sides, and uh, amplified, that charge is stored, or that potential rather, is stored on this feedback capacitor. And after the capacitor fills up, it's basically shorted out, and uh, you'll see in this graph here these rapid downward spikes. So we first start up this system, it's 
the voltage across the capacitor is right here. As an x-ray of some energy hits the detector, uh, that energy, the voltage proportional to that energy created by the detector is stored on the capacitor and that causes these upward spikes in this graph here. So that's one x-ray event and then some time passes, you have another x-ray event. This one's smaller magnitude than the first one. So this means the x-ray hitting the detector at this time was of smaller energy than this time, which means that the distance between the shells where the vacancy electron was coming from was a smaller distance. And then that's how you actually get information about the sample. And this will go on. You have a very large uh, x-ray event here. This will go on until the capacitor reaches some predefined charge, the cap is shorted out, and you're back to where you started. This happens many times per second, and uh, it basically goes on like that. And the output of the pulse processor with this signal on it is then fed to the computer system, uh, which integrates this over a long period of time and gives you a graph of energy on the x-axis and counts on the y-axis of the frequency of uh, pulses of that energy level that are occurring. And we can actually look at this exact waveform on my oscilloscope in a few minutes. Let's take a look at the hardware, hardware real quick. This is the SDD itself, the silicon drift detector, and it's mounted onto the side of my SEM. They actually have a port here specifically for um, EDS. It was very convenient. We had to make some custom mounting plates for it. Um, I'll give you a closer look at it in a second. But really bolting it up is no big deal. So. At the uh, sides of it, there's these two large heat sinks. They have Peltier modules on the inside. So these get warm while the area in between them gets quite cold, cool to negative 30 C. And this is the front or the back of the detector assembly. The detector tip is in the microscope and there's a little crank wheel on the back you can spin to slide the entire detector. You can crank it in and out of the chamber. So you would retract it set up your sample, raise your sample to the right working distance, and then you can crank the detector back in so that the tip uh, is close to the sample but not touching it. So these are the drawings of my chamber and the detector mounted to them. These are the interface plates we had to have made to mount it to the chamber. I'm going to load this sample into the SCM so we can analyze it. There's a brass sample stage, and then right here, I think there's three, possibly four, different uh, material wires that are wrapped around each other, so that'll be interesting to uh, analyze. And right here, there's a stainless steel nut, and then a little stainless steel shaving uh, came off a milling machine or something. I've got the sample loaded, so now I'm going to crank the detector so that the probe tip is closer to the sample. I just flipped on the Peltier module and it's reached minus 10 C so the high voltage bias is flipped on. If you, if you flip this on too early when you don't have a uh, good enough vacuum in the chamber things can arc and it's not not very good. So the high voltage bias is on. The set point's at roughly minus 30 degrees C, which is where it should be. The, the cooler's drawing one amp. That will come down to about 600 or 700 milliamps. Oh, or lower, so it or below the set point. And once it settles around 700 milliamps, we should be about negative 30 C, and we are. So, ready to go. And this is where that wave form will appear that I was showing you on the uh, notes over there once there's actually an x-ray spectra uh, in the chamber. Alright, so here's our sample. Right now we're looking at backscattered electrons and these are the different uh, wires that are all wrapped around each other. So if I take a look at the output from the preamplifier on my scope up there, I'll give you a better one. The triggering is kind of going crazy. So each time that these stair steps or sawtooth patterns kind of reach the top, then the, that FET is shorted out and we drop back down to the bottom. And each step on here, as we saw earlier, is a discrete x-ray event. So it's pretty neat we can actually see that. And here's the laptop. It's connected through an ethernet crossover to the pulse processor. We can see that same thing actually on here bump up the probe current again. And 
uh, there we go. Try to grab a better one. And we're back to secondary electrons here. So, we'll find the first thing we want to look at. That's uh, just for scale here, that's a Phillips head screw. And I guess we'll look at this wire. And the uh, stainless nut should be up here somewhere. Yeah, there it is. We'll take a look at that in a minute. So for now, let's move far away from that. And let's just uh, look at these wires. That's good. Before we start the x-ray acquisition, I'm going to go in and actually... Where is it? There it is. So, the secondary electron detector has a scintillator on it, and mine's going, it's on its way out anyway, and um, what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crank up the probe current in a minute here so we can get higher x-ray count, and when I do that, it's going to cause the scintillator to fail quickly, and I want to prolong its life. So there's a mode on here where I can suppress electrons from entering the detector. I'm going to enter that, and of course we lose the vast majority of our image. So now there's less electrons going into the detector. We're not going to have an image now, but I can crank up the probe current and we can get um, more x-rays without damaging my detector. And there we go. So we're starting to acquire that. And I'm going to get a little bit more probe current. Right now we're running two nanoamps, so that's a little bit high, but uh, it's okay. Just messing with the probe current a bit. There we go, probe current's much higher. Our dead time's still pretty low. And I'll let that run for a minute. Sweet. So here's our data, it's pretty cool. Now there's some advanced software that will automatically label things for you, but uh, x-ray analysis is very much so an art, and uh, I'm quite an amateur at it. But we can open up the table here, and we can start guessing at what some things are. So these were metal wires, I would assume it could be things like copper, golds, and uh, stuff like that. Now this is the low, low end energy of the spectrum, low, end, low energy end of the spectrum, this is the higher energy end of the spectrum. So things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are down here, and then heavier metals and stuff will be uh, on the right. So I know we'll have some carbon, and that's right there. And, uh, a little, maybe a little nitrogen peak there. Have oxygen in our sample. I wouldn't expect much here, not much there. We'll have aluminum for sure. Silicon. Now there's actually two peaks here, we can't differentiate between them, but there's some silicon, that's from the detector itself. Wouldn't expect phosphorus. Now, I think I've identified most of these. Uh, we have some gold, there's some silver like I was talking about, that's in the, uh, the silver paint that's holding things down. Um, possibly molybdenum. I'm gonna save the spectrum, I can look at it more later. Next thing I want to do are acquire spectra of both those stainless samples. That's good enough, that's just the surface of the nut. Suppress electrons, back down, bump up the probe current to a couple of nanoamps, and back to the computer. the acquisition. And let that run. And here's that smaller stainless sample. There we go, that's the surface of it. You can see how rough the cutting was, just like a chip off a lead or something. That's the surface of it. I just think it doesn't off a little bit. So anyway, let's acquire that. Get over the computer.
if I was actually doing any quantitative analysis and getting a percentage by mass and things like that out of the spectrum, then I wouldn't be varying the probe current as widely as I am right now. I'm just dialing it in um, to get a higher uh, count, basically to get more counts. But you want to keep that set at the same probe current throughout your entire calibration and uh, acquisition runs when you're doing actual real analysis. Right now I'm at 13 nanoamps, uh, which is quite large. Not a beam current. So I took a look at the spectra for both of these unknown stainless steel samples here, both that nut and that little shaving there, and uh, I'll show you the spectrum of one of them. They were basically the same, and I'm almost 100% certain that they're both 304 18.8 grade stainless steel, so let's take a look at the computer. So, on here, uh, I've got common percentages for uh, 304, and the biggest things are chromium and nickel, and then, uh, of course, iron is the balance, is, the, is what's left over, and it's a fairly low amount of carbon uh, in this steel. So let's take a look at that and the spectra. This huge peak here is uh, iron. It's cut off there, and then, of course, we've got two chromium peaks, iron, nickel, I would expect all of that. So there's some stuff from the detector here, the silicon, some of that's from the detector, some of that is uh, from the stainless steel, and the sulfur is from the stainless steel, I would expect that, um, that as well as the fingerprint. There's also what appears to be calcium, I'm not completely sure that it is, but uh, it's very plausible. I've seen that before when looking at other stainless steels. It's going to be an impurity. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why they would want that in the stainless. Um, but I've seen it before, so I don't think it's uh, an artifact. I, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm analyzing it correctly, but I could be wrong. So anyway, that's all for this video. I hope you learned something, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.